Mesdames, Messieurs, Ladies, Gentlemen, welcome to our Leti Innovation Days. My name is Thomas Signamarché and I am delighted to be the chairman of this exciting computing workshop. First of all, I would like to thank our sponsors that have made possible this event, so let me please thank them for their support. I would like also to invite you to use our chat systems to send questions and push debate in the good direction. Please feel free to use it. Now, let me please share with you the agenda of this workshop. We will have two sessions. The first one dedicated to frugal artificial intelligence with three presentations. Elisa Vianello from Leti, Alexandre Valencien from List, and our guest, Jeffrey Burns from IBM. The second session will be dedicated to scalable quantum computing with four presentations. Tristan Meunier from French Scientist Research Agency, Yvan Tonard from List, Pierre-André Mortemousk from Leti, and our guest, Philippe Duluc from ATOS. Let's start now with artificial intelligence. We are more and more physical person on our beautiful planet and are becoming more and more digital person with the increase of connections hubs such as smartphone and the increase of data that we are generating. Definitely, it is time to not waste data, but to manage them and use them. But as the number of devices is increasing, we need frugal solution if we still want to live in a sustainable world. Let me then introduce our first speaker. Elisa Vianello is AJI Program Director at Leti, and she will share with us how innovative hardware could help us managing efficiencies in data. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are watching from. The amount of digital data in the world first exceeded a zettabyte in 2010. To put this into perspective, to store one zettabyte of data, one billion of terabyte hard drives would be needed. Humans and computers generated more than 59 zettabytes of data in 2020, and more than 2,000 zettabytes will be produced in 2035. This escalation results from the fact that data is increasingly generated by machines. It is expected that by 2022, 90% of all the data will be generated by machines and by hundreds of billions of connected objects around the world. To efficiently transform all this raw data into useful information, data storage and computing will play an increasingly important role. The problem is power consumption. While probably many of us are aware of the problem of the energy consumption due to the slowdown in scaling benefits, it is more difficult to figure out the magnitude of the problem. It is estimated that at this pace, by 2025, the ICT industry will consume 20% of the entire world's electricity. This exponential increase in energy consumption would not be sustainable. This is the reason why the electronics community has to come up with new solutions from device and circuits and system levels. Massive usage of artificial intelligence will, uh, is mandatory to cope with these deluge uh, challenges. However, today's computing architectures are inefficient in handling AI tasks. The memory is at the center of the energy challenge. The energy cost of moving data between processor and memory can reach 90% of the total energy consumption. From the hardware standpoint, high-dense and low-power on-chip memory has to be developed. The goal is to bring memory closer to the processing unit, and when possible, the information has to be processed in situ, owing to in-memory computing. The most effective architecture to generate the highest possible density consists of crossbar arrays of metal nanowires. This extreme scalability results uh, on a footprint of 4F square per cell in a 2D architecture that would be stackable to achieve 3D arrays. This architecture requires a backend selector to suppress sneak path currents on unselected cells. Ovonic threshold switching selectors 
is one of the most interesting solutions due to its low leakage current and high on current. However, the read margin variability and sneak paths limit the crossbar bank size. To reduce variability, we recently investigated ovonic threshold switching based on a multi-layer structure. The material properties and structure can be tuned thanks to the engineering of each individual layer and in each individual layer, we can define stoichiometry, thickness and interfaces. This multi-layer structure presents improved variability control of electrical parameters with respect to the ovonic threshold switchings achieved by standard cost patterning techniques. Using a transistor instead of a backend selector as an access device is a more mature and reliable solution today. However, the size of the memory cell is constrained by the size of the access transistor itself. To overcome this challenge, we used 3D integration to fabricate a 3D monolithically stacked cell structure with two access transistors integrated one on the top of the other, reducing the cell size by a factor 1.5x with respect to planar 1T1R. Moreover, we combined the proposed architecture with multi-level cell programming to further enhance the memory density. And we were able to demonstrate up to 3.17 bit per RAM cell. By working simultaneously on the development of novel backend selectors with improved reliability and combining them with multi-level programming strategies, we should be able to improve the memory density of a factor 50 in the next years. The second major challenge from the memory technology standpoint is to reduce power consumption. Ferroelectric memories are ideal for low power information storage since they can be switched purely field controlled with negligible current consumption and at the same time they are non-volatile. However, the difficulty of fabricating ferroelectric layers and integrating them with advanced CMOS devices has hindered the scaling. Therefore, such devices are used only in niche applications today. Afnium oxide is a standard material that is available in all the, the clean rooms and it is compatible with advanced CMOS process. Ferroelectricity in silicon doped Afnia was first reported in 2011 and this has revived interest in using ferroelectric memories. Ferroelectric Afnia with atomic layer deposition techniques is compatible with three-dimensional capacitors and can solve the scaling limitations in one transistor, one capacitor ferroelectric memories. And Leti is a pioneer in the development of backend offline one transistor, one capacitor ferroelectric memories based on afnium oxide. This technology has demonstrated 1000x reduction in power consumption with respect to conventional flash memories and filamentary based technologies at the cost of a slightly reduced thermal stability. Moreover, the one transistor, one capacitor ferroelectric memory has the advantage of higher endurance and lower voltage operation that is a good point for compatibility with advanced CMOS technologies. High dense and low power emerging resistive memory technologies compatible with advanced CMOS will enable the design of energy efficient edge AI hardware based on near and in memory computing solutions. And Alexandra will present you uh, some circuit architecture in the following presentation. Now here in this presentation, I would like to focus on what is considered the weakest point of resistive memory technologies, device imperfections and variability. 
I would like to underline that the brain also functions with noisy devices and does not use any kind of error correction code. We propose to embarrass the statistical nature of emerging memories for energy efficient AI hardware. A first example of low precision neural network fully compatible with device imperfections are the binarized neural networks. The synaptic weights are stored in binary synapses and the multiplication operation is substituted by a XNOR operation. Here there is an example of hardware implementation exploiting two resistive memories as one as a single binary synapse and logic in memory reading circuits are performed, perform the XNOR operation directly into the sensing of the memory array. As you can see in, in this graph on the right, uh, these circuits work even if the devices make many errors. Up to 10 minus 3 bit error rate is tolerated without a decreasing of the accuracy. Second, I would like to spend a few words on Bayesian models. In contrast to a deterministic model obtained after gradient-based learning, where parameters are described by single precise deterministic values, Bayesian model parameters are described by distributions of probability. These distributions encapsulate parameter uncertainty, which makes the model more robust to overfitting and allows it to deal better with noisy data. When we perform inference with a Bayesian model, this parameter uncertainty propagates through the model from the input through the network till the output neurons. Why might this be useful? Imagine we train a neural network to recognize digits from 0 to 9. If your model is deterministic and we present as an input the image of a cat, because our model only knows about digits between 0 and 9, it will be forced to say something silly like uh, you have as an input a tree. In contrast, if we do the same with a Bayesian model, the, the model still only knows about digits between 0 and 9. However, because it is able to express uncertainty, it will say something, this looks most like a tree but I'm uncertain, I'm, I'm not sure about uh, it because uh, I have never seen this kind of digit before. This is a very a, a simple trivial example, but if we start to consider some kind of safety critical edge applications like uh, implantable medical devices, expressing uncertainty could potentially save someone's lives. We proposed to harness resistive memory variability to build extremely low power Bayesian models. More precisely, we proposed to exploit intrinsic cycle to cycle variability in filamentary based resistive memories as an entropy source to store the probability distribution in Bayesian neural network instead of deterministic values and we proposed a, a, a circuit architecture to enable on-chip learning directly in our chip based to Marco Chain Monte Carlo sampling. We implement the Marco Chain Monte Carlo sampling within a fabricated array of 16 kilobit devices configured as a Bayesian machine learning model. We apply the approach experimentally to solve earth arrhythmia detection task and we demonstrated 91% test accuracy. We find that the total training energy is some microjoule. These results offer a new path toward realizing intelligent systems compatible with what is the, the, the fundamental problems of resistive memories. It is compatible with the devices and it will allow to bring learning to the edge. 
So coming to, to conclusions, dense low power resistive memory technologies will pave the way for energy efficient edge AI. Embarrassing bit errors instead of fighting with it will be the starting point for an hardware revolution. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Elisa, for your presentation. It is clear that there is a huge space of innovation in front of us at hardware level. Now let me invite Alexandre Valencian, head of the System on Chip Laboratory at LIST, to share with us why frugal circuits will need such innovation. Alexandre? Thanks for the kind introduction, Thomas. Hello, everybody. As you may know, most of the AI applications today are running in the cloud, in data centers. This is because it is convenient. Processing power is available. Learning is done in the cloud, for which you need large data sets and computing power. Once learning is done, influence tasks are run on the same assets, the same hardware. But this cloud-based AI scheme is not sustainable in the long run. As more and more intelligent devices will surround us, the amount of data to be processed will increase exponentially, and the data centers will not be able to sustain the load. Part of it will have to be offloaded to the devices themselves. As a consequence, more and more people are working on hardware accelerators for performing influence tasks at the edge. There are other reasons apart from the obvious power dissipation issue. One is latency. The latency of decision making is obviously much shorter when done locally. Another one concerns the safety of operation. You might not want to constantly rely on a wireless connection. Say if you want that an autonomous, autonomous car breaks at the right time. And finally, there are privacy reasons. You keep your data local to keep them private. So, what is the main challenge with accelerators dedicated to influence applications? The main challenge is the energy dissipation. And in data-centric applications such as AI, the main source of energy comes from moving data. As you can see in this drawing, it costs much more energy to move data than to do processing on this data. Drawing operations lies in the picojoule range, even considering double precision floating point operations, while getting data from outside memories lies in the nanojoule range. It costs hundreds of times more energy to move data than to do computation on it. So the key here is to avoid moving data. The trends in edge computing are the following. First, since you want to avoid large data movements, you can start by quantizing data for having more lightweight data. You can consider 8-bit or 4-bit integer operations, for instance, instead of 32-bit floating point ones, and suffering almost no classification loss. In the same manner, you can also exploit variable bit precision with lower precision in the convolutional filters, for instance, and higher resolution in the output classifier. And finally, you want to exploit the sparsity of weights as well as the sparsity of operations. On the memory architecture side, you want your memories to be as close as possible to the processing engines to avoid moving data back and forth over long distances. For this, you can use embedded non-volatile memory for implementing dense synoptic weights and use SRAM or embedded DRAM for storing the activation results. The ultimate evolution of this scheme is to perform the computations directly inside the memory. This is the in-memory compute paradigm. The obvious advantage is reduced data movement, thus increased energy efficiency. Another advantage is that you can do operations in parallel, so they are done much faster. As an example, in a classical digital implementation of in-memory compute in an SRAM macro, an 8-bit microoperation, which is a base operation in neural networks, is sped up by a factor of 256x, and the energy efficiency is increased by a factor of 9x. That was for computing and storing the activation values. For the weights, as I said, you can use non-volatile memories. 
This is convenient since weights do not change often. There is no cyclability issue. And the benefit that comes for free is that you do not have to reload the weights each and every time you power up your circuit. At Leti, we have demonstrated with our resistive RAM technology that it is scalable and that it can handle multiple bits, up to four bits in the future. We are working to further increase the density of this embedded memory by a factor of 10x by replacing the access transistor with a backend of line selector. To give you a few numbers, if we consider the YOLO V3 topology, which is frequently used for benchmarking influence accelerators at the edge, it's 100 megabytes of weight amounts to 20 square millimeters of area with the current resistive RAM technology. And this will be scaled to below 2 square millimeters, so this is easily and cost-effectively integrable on chip. The ultimate evolution of edge computing will be to perform learning locally. When we have autonomous agents, we will want them to learn from experience to adapt to their environments. They will therefore have to demonstrate lifelong learning capacities executed locally. Note that in that case, some of, some of the learning phases can still occur in the cloud for the sharing of experience and knowledge between agents, which is called federated learning. Now, considering those accelerators for learning at the edge, they share all the challenges I've mentioned before, but they are faced with one additional challenge linked to the learning phase itself. Indeed, in order to be able to run the backpropagation algorithm, you need to store all the intermediate activation results. This is because you need them for calculating the gradient, for correcting the weights at each and every layer. And you might not need that for a single input, if you do not want to cycle your weights too much, but for a batch of inputs. Again, with the YOLO V3 example, for a batch of 20 inputs, that would amount to 800 megabytes of memory for storing the activation results. So you need very dense activation memory that cycles a lot. This is most probably DRAM technology. But given that amount of memory, it cannot be embedded. It will have to be standalone. But we've seen that the trouble with external memories is the energy access cost. Well, the solution in that case is a 3D technology which enables tight computing and memory integration. Given the large imbalance in the compute over memory ratio, SOC disaggregation in multiple tiers is a good fit. 3D integration enables large bandwidths and low latency communication at low energy cost, given the high number of parallel connections. In such architectures, the finer the pitch, the better. So we have a roadmap for decreasing that pitch over the years, thanks to hybrid bonding. Down to 3 micrometers for the chip-to-wafer assembly scheme and 1.5 micrometers for the wafer-to-wafer -wafer scheme. So what we envision is a multiple tiers, parallel architecture composed of a layer of generic processing engines for handling exotic neural network layers, a layer of in-memory computing for energy-efficient operations, a layer of non-volatile memory for storing the weights, and finally, if needed, a layer of DRAM memory for storing a large number of activations and thus enabling online learning. However, when we compared what, what engineers can achieve with current silicon implementations and what nature is achieving, it's easy to realize there's still room for improvements. This graph shows the energy efficiency versus the raw compute power of several implementations coming from academic research teams, startups, large companies. The energy efficiency is given on the y-axis in gigaops per watt. The computing power is on the x-axis in gigaops. Note that both axes are in logarithmic scale. The energy efficiency of current implementation peaks at several dozen tops per watt which is estimated to be two orders of magnitude below that of the bee brain and six orders of magnitude below the one of the human brain. So, taking inspiration from biology seems like a good idea. How does that translate into circuit or technology specifications? First, when we look at how the brain is made, 
We see that it is massively problem with 100 billion neurons and 10,000 synapses per neuron on average. The neurons and synapses are deeply intertwined in a 3D fabric. We do not have all the neurons on one side and all the synapses on the other side. This may seem foolish when I say it like this, but this is precisely how GPUs are made today, with HBM memories on the sides of the processing chip. Biology has taken the special localization of data to the extreme, so we need high density storage very close to neurons. Secondly, we know that the brain does part of the computing in the synapses. To the first order, synapses do weight the inputs. So we need some kind of computational memory technology. You can consider it as analog in-memory compute. Thirdly, the computation engines are analog. Neurons accumulate synaptic inputs in their soma and fire when a given threshold is reached. And finally, communication is digital. It comes in the form of spikes. Spikes are unary events. They are not even binary. There was an event or not. There is no value associated with the height or the length of the voltage pulse. This coding type is robust to noise even over long distances, which is why it was chosen by evolution. But it is also sparse, and we know from information theory that sparse communication in time maximizes energy efficiency. We have designed and fabricated a proof of concept circuit combining spike coding, resistive RAM based synapses, and analog neurons. The neuron can be abstracted as a capacitor for storing the synaptic inputs over time, plus a voltage comparator for generating an output spike when the threshold is crossed. The computations performed by the synapses and neurons exploit physical laws, namely Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's law, so they exhibit a high energy efficiency. This proof of concept circuit was fabricated using 130 nanometer CMOS based wafers with resistive RAMs post-processed at Leti in the back end of line. The resistive RAM array can be seen at the top right corner of the chip micrograph. This chip is now used in a demo in our showroom. Visitors can draw digits using their finger on a surface tablet, which converts it into a 256 gray levels image. It is then sent to an FPGA that handles the interface with the circuit and converts this image into a train of spikes, following a frequency encoding scheme. On average, we measured that an image is correctly classified with less than one spike per synaptic connection, thus demonstrating the sparsity of this coding scheme. It necessitates only 25 nanojoules of energy per classification. Obviously, the major issue with an analog implementation is its intrinsic viability which you do not suffer from in a cycle accurate digital implementation. So such implementations are very well tailored to even best processing very close to sensors with online fine tuning or learning mechanisms for handling variability. But since we want to target high accuracy pattern recognition and of high resolution images or LIDAR point clouds, we resorted to a fully digital implementation for our second generation spiking neural network accelerator with resistive RAM synapses. This new circuit that we see here, fabricated on 28 nanometer FDSI base wafers, is scalable. It is composed of uh, eight convolutional cores, implementing 50,000 neurons and 25,000 shared synapses per square millimeter. The energy efficiency is very good at 1.6 picojoule per synaptic event. It is below the state of the art by a factor of three to 10 X and actually below biological neurons, whose energy dissipation is estimated to lie in the 10 picojoule range. It takes only 750 nanojoules to classify a SAFAR-10 image using a ResNet-11 network topology. In conclusion, frugal edge AI devices need the right combination of technology and circuit solutions. We have seen that the main challenge of either Influence only or online learning accelerators is to avoid data movement as much as possible. This can be achieved thanks to a combination of in memory computing, non volatile memory for storing the weights, and 3D technology for heterogeneous integration of DRAM. 
And we have shown that brain inspiration is also a good mean to device solutions for increasing the energy efficiency. Leti is working to advance those technologies. I thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandre. Nice presentation, so much potential in spiking our network for low power AI devices. To conclude this session, let me please welcome our guest. Jeffrey Burns is Director of AI Compute at IBM Research. And Jeffrey will share with us a full picture of frugal AI from hardware up to neural network and algorithms. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, I will be presenting some work going on in IBM Research under the title of Efficient AI Acceleration, a Full Stack Approach. I'd like to start out by pointing out, even though AI is extraordinarily exciting, um, presenting a huge opportunity to automate a dramatic um, new um, set of um, operations that we cannot otherwise automate, even simple forms of AI present a very, very big challenge for computing. Uh, for example, if we look at image recognition using the ImageNet 22K dataset and the ResNet 101 network, to train this network a single time um, on a four GPU system takes 16 days. If you happen to have a 256 GPU system, you can drive the training time down to seven hours or one time per day. Um, in both of these cases, note that the energy consumption is about the same as powering a house for two weeks. So a very, very large amount of energy is consumed, but think about the innovation cycle. If you can only train your model twice a month or even once a day, the innovation cycle will be very, very slow. So we have a dramatic opportunity because of the accuracy of deep learning and other emerging AI techniques, but a very, very difficult compute challenge to solve in order to fully take advantage of these opportunities. These sorts of observations led us in IBM Research to create the IBM Research AI Hardware Center and we started from day zero saying we really need to take a full stack approach. And by that, I mean all the way from considering process technology shown on the bottom of the diagram here on the right um, and integration tech, uh, new packaging and integration technologies, um, novel devices, moving up into the design and architecture domain how do we design new compute cores from scratch for deep learning? Um, moving up the stack, how do we enable them so that they can be effectively used by programmers and um, easily integrated with other applications? And then finally, how do we, on the one hand, showcase these new technologies in the context of applications and similarly, how do we take an emerging application in from the top and understand how that application will drive the lower level innovations in the future? So when we founded the center, we took this full stack approach because we felt that a set of slices or working on a subset of the problem simply wouldn't uh, address the challenges I mentioned briefly a moment ago. Uh, we launched the center in February of 2019 and made a very major investment commitment at that time over five years, uh, 2 billion uh, to be precise. Um, and we have 16 members in the center and we are uh, steadily growing. The way that we are anchoring our work um, from a mental point of view is to focus on how do we create new AI cores with dramatically improved compute efficiency as a function of time, um, trying to achieve a, a, a 1000 X performance improvement over 10 years or so. Now we began um, focusing on digital techniques, innovating in the architecture space and in the arithmetic and algorithm space 
um, using conventional CMOS technology. That's what you see labeled as AI core family one. Um, then we will bring in, in AI core family two, advanced packaging to further bolster the capabilities of these techniques. Um, and then a bit later in time, AI core families three and four, bringing in analog computation to augment the digital computation. The reason we're focusing on cores is a core provides a very convenient building block, allowing one to scale capabilities according to the power dissipation and the performance requirements of the space, um, all the way from very small instantiations like IoT and sensor applications, scaling all the way up to data centers where there may be many, many accelerators, each with many hundreds of cores um, providing a tremendous amount of compute capability for the data center end of the spectrum. The way we are driving our work starts from algorithms. We started working on um, algorithms for deep learning in the early 2010s. And in 2015, we published one of the seminal findings, namely that you could train deep neural networks in 16-bit arithmetic compared to the standard at the time of 32 without losing any accuracy. And we have stayed on this journey of reducing precision ever since. The reason we are doing this is when you change the operand width, the computational efficiency of your engine goes up in a nonlinear fashion. A factor of two reduction in operand width allows you to quadruple the efficiency of the compute engine. So it's a very powerful way to improve compute. One of our most recent examples of this is our Gen 3 core, third generation core, which we published at ISSCC in February of this year, demonstrating for the first time hybrid FP8 training without loss of accuracy and also in for inference. Now, moving forward, I mentioned that we will bring analog computation in. And the motivation here is to reduce data movement. When you think about a digital computation, the computation starts on the disk, traverses the entire system hierarchy down to a multiplier unit, and then all the way back out to the disk. A lot of time and a lot of power are consumed in all of that data transfer. The analog technique we are working on leaves the weights stationary in a memory-like array and does the computations in place, taking advantage of materials, non-volatile materials that came from the memory technology world. Now, this is a very, very challenging way to do compute because you need to implement an ideal programmable conductance to make this style of computation feasible. We find that no such ideal element uh, material exists now. Um, fortunately, we have a very, very strong materials research activity as part of our AI center. So to give a couple of examples, um, all the way on the left, um, as you tune this conductance, as you train the network, you would like an increase in conductance and a decrease in conductance during the tuning process, you would like that curve to be symmetric. Unfortunately, PCM material, which is um, the leading material in the space, is smooth on one side, but very abrupt transition on the other. So a, a much better material with better symmetry is desired. Um, that's what you see um, illustrated here in the box labeled two, um, summarizing very br briefly some of our work on our RAM materials. Um, similarly, we need um, stability, for example, against temperature drift. In the box labeled one, you see some of our results using a novel liner material around the PCM to maintain much better temperature stability than a conventional PCM material uh, would afford. Um, and then finally, um, in order to deal with some of these non-idealities non of the materials, um, we have a robust activity in algorithms 
to compensate on the algorithmic side for imperfect materials um, as well. Here's an example of some of our exciting recent results where we have demonstrated the industry's first matrix vector multiply completely in 14 nanometer based PCM material. Um, we've achieved a very, very impressive accuracy so far um, on relatively small networks like MNIST, um, but we're actively working on, on larger networks at the moment. Um, at the VLSI symposium this year in June, um, you will find several papers um, highlighting our work in this area, which is combining materials and architecture and precision re reduction to achieve uh, yet again a, another step forward in terms of AI compute efficiency. Um, on the right of the chart here, you see one of our test setups, uh, which we use to validate our 14 nanometer hardware. Now, I mentioned them in the beginning that we're working on heterogeneous integration or advanced packaging. Why are we doing that? We want to maintain system balance. So as you improve compute efficiency of your compute engines, um, packing more and more and more operations per area of silicon, it's very, very important to increase bandwidth, increase memory capacity, and so on in order to keep um, all of that hardware operating to avoid the problem of having silicon that's not being used or dark silicon. We feel that heterogeneous integration is a very, very promising domain in which to innovate to maintain that system balance. Uh, we are working on several different techniques because in this space, we feel like um, there is no uh, one size fits all, so to speak. Um, starting from the left, um, you see uh, uh, some pictures of our work in very high density organic laminates um, where we drive to uh, achieve the density that you can uh, realize with a silicon carrier, but in a much less expensive and more scalable, scalable organic laminate. Moving one to the right, um, we're working on silicon bridge technology to enable adjacent chips to be connected together with very, very <clears throat> dense interconnects without requir requiring through silicon vias. Um, one more to the right, um, you also see um, an illustration of our work on 3D, which in some sense is the, um, the ultimate embodiment of heterogeneous integration. Um, and of course, it's very, very important to have a robust modeling activity. Um, otherwise, um, <clears throat> the use of these techniques and the selection uh, will be non-optimal. Um, finally, let me talk briefly about our end user test bed, our connection to the outside world. Um, we feel that a number of different capabilities are required to explore these innovations, to show these innovations in context, and as I mentioned before, to bring in new applications from the outside. So we have a supercomputer, uh, very rich with accelerators for large scale training jobs. We have full access to the IBM public cloud with all of its AI capabilities. Uh, we have a, a system called the composable test bed, which allows us to arrange these new accelerators in a system configuration to determine the optimal system topology for them. Um, and finally, we bring in um, many research AI software capabilities from our colleagues um, elsewhere in IBM research focused on AI theory and software. So with that, um, I would like to emphasize again that we feel that the way to leverage the opportunity of AI is to take a full stack approach. The escalating compute requirements require that. So I've shown you how we work all the way from the bottom of the stack on materials and advanced packaging through the architecture layer and through the software and applications layers. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Jeffrey. It is always precious to have IBM Vision, especially on AI. So this concludes our first session. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and that they gave you ideas and confidences 
in how semiconductors-based solutions can create new opportunities for artificial intelligence. Let me please now open the second session about quantum computing. At one point, it is obvious that AI will be part of the answer to cope with the data deluge. But on another hand, we'll still need pure computing solutions. And I think we are all quite convinced that new computing paradigms will be needed. This is what com quantum computing will offer, and more precisely, this is what large-scale quantum computing will demonstrate. Let me please introduce our first speaker, Tristan Meunier, physicist at French Scientific Research Agency, who will share with us his vision of quantum computer metrics and strategy. Tristan? Thank you, Thomas, for uh, the nice introduction. I am indeed a CNRS researcher working at Institut Neel in Grenoble. My main research focus is the development of a quantum chip on silicon qubit. This is a research effort that is done in a collaboration between CNRS and CEA Leti and ERIC. The goal of my talk is to give you a broad picture of the quantum computing effort in focusing on metrics and strategy. Two main factors are explaining the interest in quantum computing. First, there is a constant increase in industry for high performance uh, computation to design new medicine and new materials, but also to optimize activities such as delivery or banking exchange. Up to, up to now, this increase was following the incredible development of microelectronics and computers. The question surrounding the continuation of this increase forces inspection for alternative ways of computing. One of them is quantum computing. So let's first understand how to build a quantum chip. An example of architecture consists in placing at the node of a 2D array quantum objects. On this object, you need to do three types of operations. Similar than in classical computer, each bit has to be measured efficiently. The two other operations that has, has no counterpart in classical physics. The one qubit is used to put every possible qubit in a superposition of zero and one characterized with a specific phase. The Q2, two qubit gate is used to entangle two qubit by controlling, uh, controlling the nearest neighbor interaction. And it enables to create quantum correlation within the whole quantum array, which is the basis of quantum computation. The quality and the robustness of these gates are one of the main properties followed by the expert in the field. The associated matrix is the fidelity of the gates. It is important since it tells you how many gates could you perform before losing the quantum property of the array. I listed on this graph the uh, fidelity of this gate for different chip realization and for different platforms. In reason of the important effort in superconducting qubit nowadays, a number of chips has been reported within this technology. One of them is the famous Google chips, which has the most impressive fidelity so far. Several other technologies have been presented in atomic systems, for example, ion trap and condalton, but also recently in electron spin qubit in semiconductor. As you can see on this graph, all the fidelity so far are reasonably similar for all these systems. Fidelity tells you how many gates you can do, but it doesn't tell you how many gates you need to perform a calculation. This is why the fidelity uh, matrix is incomplete. To understand it, an important property of the array is what we call connectivity. In the device discussed for superconductor and qubit, with only nearest neighbors interaction, untangling two distant qubits requires to displace the qubit states from one place to the other of the array. It has a cost in the number of gates that you need to perform. The situation is different, for example, in ion trap, where all to all connectivity is possible and untangling two distant qubits only requires a single operation. Therefore, increasing the connectivity is a way to reduce drastically the number of operations needed to perform an algorithm. To go beyond the fidelity of the gate and take into account the connectivity of the array, two metrics have been proposed. The first one is coming from IBM and is a comparison between the number of qubits and the depth of the, of the array or how many operations you are allowed to perform on n qubit before losing the quantum property of the array. Importantly, for connectivity, the depth 
is being calculated for with the fidelity of the two qubit gate if you take into account any couple of the qubit uh, array. This is the metrics that has been compared to the most quantum hardware so far, with the highest value corresponding to 22 qubits in ion trap because of the high connectivity. It stresses the importance of the connectivity in quantum computers. Another proposition coming from ATOS, the ATOS Q-score, is to take an algorithm like the mask cut and identify at which number of qubits we lose the quantumness of the system. And in running this, in, in running this algorithm, you can infer this quantity. It is reminiscent to what has been done by Google on the quantum supremacy experiment, but apply on algorithm with potential interest for high performance uh, computation. To my knowledge, this matrix has not been so far extracted for the quantum hardware that I've been discussed uh, and presented so far. It is worth noting that this metrics so far concentrate only on the quantum hardware. In the full stack approach, and especially if large scale is targeted, the quantum sheet is embedded in a larger structure and more metrics are needed. I present in this slide a visualization of the full stack of a quantum processor. On the top, you have the software part that I will not describe so much in this talk, and that is needed to program the quantum hardware. But already at the hardware level, combination of technology are needed to be able to control the quantum hardware that goes beyond the physical property like connectivity and fidelity, and requires to pay attention on technological properties. In the following, I will focus on our project on silicon qubit to illustrate this observation on few points that are relevant for the development of a quantum chip. Having, having strategy on how to interface the quantum chip to a control system is a major focus. And we can understand that because of the numerous of connectivity that is then needed to control the quantum objects at large scales. Here I present the technological push that is envisioned to build a fully functional quantum chip. It is necessary to think on, on how to integrate and arrange the spin qubit. And here I present on this slide some example of an array of, qubit, of, of electron spin qubit defined in FDSOI. In a 2D plane, here with a recent publication uh, on the left side, or in a 3D scalable architecture that combines all the functionality for the qubits. This defines the quantum chip. Second, the classical control system needs to be designed to control and probe the quantum chip. And finally, it has to be integrated as close as possible from the quantum chip on an interposer to allow scaling of the control. This step requires integration and packaging te technology similar to the chipset technology used in nanoelectronics. Some part of this development will be detailed in the talk of Ivan Tonar. A second important aspect is the variability of the quantum bit circuit. Reducing it as much as possible is known in electronics to be crucial for scaling and it usually gives rise to a compact model used in, design, in the design of quantum circuits. To obtain such information, statistical characterization on qubits is needed and it has to be performed at low temperature where the qubits are defined. That is why we acquire a cryoprober from Blue Force to be able to probe quantum chip at 2K, 2 Kelvin. The machine is up running and permits, for example, to investigate the threshold voltage at high and low temperature in a single gate device, or to see at which voltage a single electron is trapped in a device with a double gate, one defining the electron uh, trap, the other the electrometer. You will uh, hear more information about statistical characterization in the talk of Pierre-André Mortemusk. Finally, the larger the, the quantum chip, the larger the energy dissipation will be. It is especially true when you have on the same chip the quantum and the control system, as we envision. It leads us to investigate solutions to increase the available cooling power at different temperatures. This graph on the left side gives you the state of the art in terms of cooling power and the associated technology. The lower the temperature, this is what we see on this graph, the smaller is the cooling power. For spin qubit, we can operate at relatively high temperature, close to alpha Kelvin. That is why we are developing new cryostat to overcome limitation in cooling power. And the target that we have is 100 milliwatt cooling power at alpha Kelvin. All these remarks are the basis of this table that summarizes the key metrics that we 
discuss and we give the associated number for different platforms, including the one that we already discuss and novel one like Envy Centers of Major, Major, Majorana Fermions. It is effectively more complex than a single number, but it is more complete as well and represents the compromises that one is facing when building a large shell quantum uh, chip. To finish, I flash you the roadmap of the quantum silicon uh, Grenoble project. Built on our first demonstration of a single spin qubit, we have been gathering skill to go eventually to large scale, with a six qubit in the two coming years, going to few tens of afterwards. Here is the picture of the group. 50 engineers and researchers are currently working on all aspects of silicon-based quantum computation. With all that, I thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to answer your question during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thanks, Tristan. It is always good to keep in mind that qubits are important, but behind them, there are plenty of other technology needed for large-scale quantum computing. Now, let Ivan Tonar, senior expert in system on chip at least, talk about cryogenic and required architectures. Thank you, Thomas. Hello, everyone. As mentioned in Tristan's talk, Scaling of the quantum volume for large-scale quantum computing is a key target to address larger and larger problems. To reach these objectives, we need to control more qubits with high fidelity. This means we have to design efficient control architectures and circuits that can operate on qubits at cryogenic temperatures. However, looking at today's architectures, control is done essentially at room temperature and wired to the cryostat containing the qubits with several cables per qubit. Clearly, this brings a strong limitation to the scalability of the system to large-scale quantum computers targeting several thousands or millions of qubits. Not only we need to find room for all these cables, but also every cable is a thermal path that needs to be considered in the cooling budget. So we really need to think of an architectural shift to overcome this limitation to scalability. Essentially, we need to break this linear scaling between cables and qubits. We have to develop new solutions that will allow driving large qubit arrays with a limited amount of connectivity. And this is one of our main activities in the program through, through the use of cryonectronics in the com quantum computer architecture. This additional stage in the control stack allows us to integrate multiplexing with limited connectivity with the lab at room temperature. The development of cryotronics allows us to develop integrated functions close to the qubits so we can have a fine control and readout of the quantum states and pre-process this information to alleviate the connectivity needs with the room temperature. Cryoelectronics actually allows us to consider having a real integrated cryo -lab laboratory on chip so that physics remain close to the qubits while room temperature software and equipment can be dedicated to computing. For solid-state spin qubits, the different operations that are required at low level are calibration, manipulation, and measurement. We need first to calibrate the environment to precisely control the electrostatic neighborhood of the quantum dots to form single electron spin qubits that will be able to interact together. Then, we want to manipulate the qubit array requiring to sequence the spin rotations for single qubit operations and tune the exchange between spins for two, two qubit gates. Finally, we have to probe energy levels of the qubits to sense the qubit state. To realize those different functions, we rely on cryogenic compatible CMOS design. Low temperatures lead to a huge reduction uh, of the transistor leakage which is a good opportunity to reduce the power consumption of circuits for limited joule heating. However, cryogenic temperatures also lead to a large increase of the threshold voltage, which slows down the transistor speed. Thanks to fully depleted silicon on insulator technology, we are able to overcome this issue with forward, forward back biasing of the devices and recover high-speed transistors. Both effects combined enable high-speed, ultra-low leakage cryo-CMOS control electronics. 
Leveraging FDSOI, we were able to build essential functions for cryogenic manipulation and readout of the qubits. First, regarding calibration and control, we have been able to design a high-precision cryo digital-to-analog converter with 8-bit control and 12.5 microvolt precision operating at up to 100 MHz at 4 Kelvin. This work has been published in 2020 in the IEEE Solid State Circuit Letters. It uses a fully segmented current steering architecture for very high linearity with only 7 microwatts power consumption. As regards measurement, we have been working on closely coupled trans-impedance amplifiers for high sensitivity charge readout of quantum devices. Based on a splitting of the quantum energy levels and fine-tuning of the Fermi level, it is possible to leverage blockades in the electron flow for current sensing of the quantum state that can be amplified using TIAs with up to 100 millivolts per nanoampere. With less than 12, uh, 10 picoampere per square root of hertz input noise. These works were presented at the 2020 International Solid State Circuits Conference. With very low power and area footprints, our cryo CMOS designs also allow us to con consider compensating qubit process variability across the array by driving dedicated calibration gates to level the electrostatic environment. This way, we can get a uniform qubit plane with compatible energy levels for spin exchanges between qubits, so as to achieve full entanglement of our qubit state on the whole array. But this requires to control many gates across the array, and we definitely want to avoid a multiplication of the cables for this. Therefore, we have been working on control demultiplexing and readout multiplexing for a scalable solution. To this end, we use sample and hold techniques for the control to drive all electrostatic environment at a megahertz rate from only a few gigahertz sources. Regarding readout, we perform frequency-based measurements that are collected on multiplexed frequencies. Now, this actually does not change the number of connections to the qubits, but serves to reduce the wiring towards room temperature. We are also working on close integration of the qubits with the cryoelectronics using dense connections between chips for integration in a single package. We develop superconducting interconnects on an interposer, which is used to stack FDSOI circuits with quantum devices. This goes all the way down to the qubits with a dense fan in on multiple metal levels with refining pitches all the way down to the qubit array pitch around 100 nanometers. We are then able to assemble dies with a 3D stacking process using cryogenic compatible microbumping. We use tin silver alloys on copper pillars, which present a superconducting transition for temperatures below 4 Kelvin. We validated, we validated the electrical and mechanical robustness at low temperatures over several thermal cycles between cryogenic and room temperatures. Thanks to this 3D stacking technology on superconducting interposer, we are able to achieve these dense connections between qubits and cryo CMOS while reducing the overall wiring outside the cryostat, which opens great perspectives for large-scale architectures. To sum up, we have been gathering several technologies to get ready for the scaling up of quantum computers with an architectural shift using cryoelectronics and cryo packaging. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Ivan, for your presentation. Definitely, we need innovative solutions to operate and control the qubits, and we have to be ready for that. Let me now welcome Pierre-André Mortemusk, research engineer at Leti, and discover with him how to deal with systematic and large-scale characterization of qubits. Thank you, uh, and hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to speak about how to push at large scale the cryogenic device characterization for quantum technology applications. More precisely, I will present a new tool acquired a few weeks ago by CEA in the work frame of the ERC Synergy q -Cube. It's a unique in Europe cryogenic 300 mm wafer prober. 
As you know, Grenoble gathers a variety of academic and industrial labs that engineer and produce quantum devices directly on 300 mm silicon wafers. As you understand from the previous presentations, this workflow aims at demonstrating the reproducible fabrication of large-scale quantum chips. The first demonstration of a CMOS qubit was performed at CA five years ago in 2016. It was demonstrated that a spin qubit could be manipulated with a single gate and read out using an adjacent qubit. This device was produced on a 300 mm wafer together with tens of thousands of other devices. Now, beyond the proof of principle scale, the quantum silicon project needs two things. First, we need to bring each state-of-the-art measurement or manipulation demonstration to a standard and systematic characterization protocol. Second, we want to rapidly explore both new qubit architectures and control protocols to support the design and the control algorithm teams. Here, I will rapidly recap some differences between a transistor and a single qubit. As you know, a transistor is a potential barrier between a source and a drain. This barrier is controlled by a gate, which geometry is specific to each technology node. Most often, it works at room temperature with a relatively large VDS. Now, a silicon qubit is a two-level system encoded in a spin degree of freedom of either an electron or a hole. It must be confined in a quantum dot, which is nothing more than a potential dip between barriers. The morphology of a single quantum dot can be very similar to a transistor, except maybe for the large spacers used as potential barriers. The operating temperature and VDS are constrained by the energy separation between the qubit ground state and its first excited state. This is the reason why cryogenic temperatures are necessary to operate a qubit. I will briefly explain now how are performed the characterization and test protocols. For device characterization and room temperature or higher temperatures, the industry provides wafer probers that can directly take batches of wafers. Typi uh, typically, a single wafer can be assessed within a couple of hours. On the other side, performing experiments at cryogenic temperatures takes a much longer time. And this for two reasons. First, the wafer cannot be directly measured. Devices must be prepared at a single die level. Moreover, cooling down the die or the device also implies to cool down part of the setup either down to 4 Kelvin, like in this optical cryostat, or down to 10 millikelvin in division refrigerators. There, the typical turnover time for a single or a few devices is days to months. The response of the industry was engineering a cryogenic wafer probe. As I mentioned earlier, CA has acquired very recently a cryogenic 300 mm wafer probe. It is in produced by Blue Force in collaboration with Afore, and it is the first in Europe of its kind. The major difference with any other cryogenic setup is that a full wafer can fit and be probed in the cryogenic chamber. The wafer temperature is below 2 Kelvin. By moving the wafer in the chamber, it's possible using a probe card to electrically contact any device of any die, while maintaining the wafer at a temperature below 2 Kelvin. And the displacement of the wafer from device to device is fast, so that it's possible to characterize a single device within a few minutes, all the heads included. As this equipment was installed only a few weeks ago, we are still in the ramp-up phase. Nevertheless, we already have a huge gain in the statistical measurements. We have characterized about 100 devices distributed over 20 dies in a couple of weeks. I will briefly describe what we can measure with this instrument. First, we can measure transistor characteristics. As you have heard today, it is of prime importance to operate transistors at cryogenic temperatures to build control circuits. And building these circuits requires a precise modeling of the transistors. To realize these models, the large-scale characterization and eventually parametric tests can be performed in the probe between 2 and 30 Kelvin. Then, of course, quantum dots are characterized. We already started the characterization of a few metrics, like the quantum dot charging energy, or gate lever arms, 
and the quantum dot uniformity. As we build up our measurement library, more metrics will be measured. And finally, what we intend to do more on the long term is the exploration of the quantum dot architecture and control protocols. As an example of this transistor characterization, here I show the IDVG curves realized at room temperature. From these measurements, we extract the threshold voltage of the transistors. Similar experiments are performed on the same transistors at, at cryogenic temperatures. And then, uh, in this illustrative plot, we compare the correlation in the threshold voltages between 2 Kelvin and room temperature. It allows to extrapolate from room temperature measurements low temperature behaviors. In our initial characterization of quantum dots, we use four terminal devices. There is a source, a drain, and two gates facing each other. Each gate can control a quantum dot formed at the corner of a nanowire. In our measurements, we use one quantum dot as an observer and the other quantum dot as a target. When sweeping both gate voltages, we record a stability diagram. You can notice that the blue lines of high current are interrupted. In fact, these interruptions are the signature of an electron entering or leaving the target quantum dot. Here, because of, we see no other interruption, we know that in this voltage region that we have the single electron confined in the target quantum dot. When recording the stability diagram of a wider range, it, it is possible to look for spurious dots or so-called impurities nearby the quantum dots. They will couple to the system and disrupt the stability lines as overlaid here. As I said, we are in the ramp-up phase. However, we intend to perform also characterization for more advanced quantum devices, such as arrays of quantum dots, to test their operability and validate each quantum device. Then, these devices will be interfaced with control electronics on interposers, as described earlier by Ivo. We also envision for 2D arrays of quantum dots to find the initial tuning parameters for the gate voltages in order to trap the electrons in the quantum dots. This will be part of more general feature characterization and functionality tests. To summarize this talk, we are on a daily basis increasing more and more the throughput of devices being characterized. This allows a rapid and efficient feedback for all parts of the quantum silicon project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pierre-André. Even with qubit specificities, you are right. We need to reach semiconductor standard and state-of-the-art to ensure manufacturability. To conclude this session, I am delighted to welcome our guest, Philippe Duluc, Chief Technology Officer, Big Data and Security at ATOS, who will share with us his vision of application and challenges for the near term. Hello everyone, I am Philippe Deluc. Uh, I am the, the CTO of the Big Data and Security Division of Atos. This is the product divisions of uh, Atos Group, and I will uh, present you uh, applications and challenges for near-term quantum computing. Uh, first, some word about our history, uh, the story of the Atos Quantum Program. This has been launched in 2016 and launched for business reasons. Uh, we know that uh, Quantum technologies are producing two disruptions in our field. The first one is in computing because, uh, you know, it's more and more difficult to speed up the, the computing due to the slowing of the Moore's law. And perhaps quantum computing would be the solution to continue to speed up the, the, the computing. And the other description is uh, relative to uh, cybersecurity. Uh, there is this huge risk of uh, cyber attack uh, against asymmetric cryptography due to the quantum uh, algorithm, the Shor the Shore algorithm. And for that reason, this program has been, has been launched in 2016 by uh, Thierry Breton. Uh, and here is the, the, the program, what has been decided in, in 2016. Two, three topics. The first one is uh, about the quantum software, uh, a platform to learn quantum. It's classical part of our program, and we have developed this QLM, which is an appliance to learn uh, quantum by uh, 
opti uh, programming, optimizing, and also simulating the execution of the of the quantum uh, of the quantum algorithms. The second topic in our program is the the real quantum part, the real hardware part. We want to accelerate uh, the computing by adding some quantum capabilities in our hybrid supercomputing. And uh, we have begun to, to work with partners, for example, the French startup, Pasqual, uh, but also other potential partners, uh, IQT in Austria, for example, or IQM in Finland. And we are working the, with this partner because we, we are not investing in, uh, in the physics uh, within Atos. We are, we are not investing in the hardware and we rely on partners. And what we are doing is integration and uh, integration and uh, the software and the middleware part of the hybrid supercomputing. And I will show you an example in the next slide. And just uh, to, to know about the first, the third topic, which is uh, related to cybersecurity. We have decided to to develop a post quantum algorithm and to in, implement this post quantum algorithm, cryptographic algorithm, in our cybersecurity equipment. Now, uh, some uh, more details about our QLM. This QLM is really an appliance. Uh, it's a it's a server. Uh, enterprise servers uh, with very uh, high uh, memory. And with this uh, server, we are able to simulate quantum algorithms functioning with between 30 qubits and 41 qubits. Why? It's because we are limited uh, due to the, the, the size of the memory and we are obliged to simulate all the, all the Hilbert space. We are no, it's normal uh, to be limited in number of qubits. And uh, 41 qubits, it, it, it's quite good. We are also able to simulate the physics of the of the of the hardware, as we will see in the in the in, in the in this slide. In this slide, I, I will show you this because it's very interesting. On the top, we have the mathematical program. It's uh, running on five qubits from Q0 to Q4, and uh, it's the the program of the quantum uh, uh, Fourier transform. It's an important program, and because, for example, the Shor algorithm is rely, relying uh, deeply on this uh, on this module the Fourier the Fourier transform this is the mathematical description and if i want to run this program on a real hardware for example the IBM hardware we have on the, on the top right we see that this hardware is 5 qubits for sure but with a limited uh, interconnection for example the qubit number 0 is not connected to the qubit number 4 and for that reason we are obliged to change the program, and you see the animation on the, on the, on the bottom of the, on the slide, we are obliged to insert other gates, new gates, for example, the, the switch, the, the swap gate, uh, to exchange the position of the qubits. And after this, it is functioning, but we have more gates. And this is uh, quite complex. Uh, it's uh, difficult because the more you have gates, the more you, you will have noise, and perhaps the circuit will collapse before the the solving of the, of the, of the computing, the example you have here. But no uh, the near term computing. And, uh, it's very difficult today because we have noise, we have the stability of the qubits and so on. It's very difficult to, to uh, develop uh, uh, correction, uh, uh, detection and, and correction of the, of the, of the mistakes uh, we have uh, with the qubits because we have this uh, theorem of non-cloning, non you cannot duplicate a qubit. So it's very difficult today uh, to, to, correct, to correct the qubit. Uh, you need almost uh, 1,000 physical qubits to have just one uh, logical, uh, perfect qubit. But we have the NISC revolution, Noise Intermediate Scale Quantum Computing. It has been uh, uh, developed by uh, John Preskin uh, some years ago. And uh, it's, it's saying that uh, we can compute with noisy qubit, first good news. And also, we can have a quantum superiority with between 50, 100, and today we see 200 qubits. Only with these qubits, noisy qubits, we, we can have results. Uh, very interesting, we can have quantum superiority. Two examples. The first one uh, is the 
de EQ algorithm, it's a variational algorithm uh, running on a NISC uh, hardware. And uh, with this algorithm, we are able, for example, to uh, simulate electronic orbitals of big molecules. Because today it's easy uh, with a supercomputer, with the small molecules, but it's impossible with large molecules. Another example of uh, NISC algorithm, uh, the QAOA, which is an algorithm used for combinatorial optimization. And uh, this is very useful for uh, research scheduling, for example, and even on a non-supervised uh, machine learning like uh, clustering is running with QAOA. So we have uh, real, real applications today with uh, real usage uh, and uh, providing quantum superiority. And we think that it's our position in Atos that in 2023, we will be able to propose on the market uh, a quantum accelerator, a quantum NISC accelerator, uh, which will be connected to Atos computing infrastructure. How is done this uh, connection? But what we will do, it's very simple. We use uh, our knowledge uh, in uh, supercomputing and so on. We are very, very specialized on that, uh, the scheduler. Uh, and what will be possible to do in 2023? It will be possible to program a quantum algorithm with, for example, MyQLM. MyQLM is the freeware, hein, uh, giving everybody the possibility to program a quantum algorithm on, uh, on, their, on their laptop. You will program the MyQLM. After that, you will use the QLM. The QLM is an in-memory computer. And on the QLM, you will be able to run the classical part of the hybrid algorithm, because VQE and QAO are hybrid algorithms. That means that there is a, a, a quantum part and a classical part. And we will be able to run this algorithm on the, on the Compatos QLM. And we will be able, thanks to the QLM wrapper and the special plugin, we will be able to run also quantum processing units uh, connected, for example, the, the QPU from Pascal or the QPU for from uh, IQM. This, this is the first step. And now the second step, we, we will connect it, but after uh, 2023, with a real, uh, a real supercomputer uh, from, from ITOS. And in the next year, it will be really possible to run NISC algorithm and we hope in a, in a production. Last one, what will be the, the next step? Because we have this NISC uh, for the, but the problem with NISC is limited to a very small number of al algorithms. Uh, we, have, we have spoken about uh, VQE, QAOA. Uh, but we have the objective to have more algorithms and uh, this is what we call the large scale computing. I, can not, I cannot give you a, a date hein, about this, but this is a priority of the, of the French quantum plan. And also, we are very happy to collaborate, to cooperate with the ethos Lady on the QLSI project, hein, uh, which objective is to have the demonstration of the reality of the, of the LSQ, thanks to uh, the silicon technology that Lady is developing. So this is a very good news for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippe, for your presentation. Near-term applications of quantum computing are becoming a reality, and clearly, large-scale quantum computing technology will offer long-term solutions. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this quantum computing session and our computing workshop. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and once again, I would like to thank the speaker for their remarkable presentation. Please stay tuned, Letty is already forecasting additional events in October and December and we will enjoy welcoming you again to this debate and push innovation together. Last but not least, let me also thank again our sponsor for the precious support. Mesdames, Messieurs, Ladies, Gentlemen, stay tuned, take care and hope to see you soon.